Welcome to the Clear Slide and Serious Decisions webinar, Sales Engagement Technology, Guiding Reps and Delivering Buyer Insights. We will get started in a couple minutes. So to start, we'll conduct a quick sound check. If you can hear me, please click Ask a Question and type Yes. We'll take 10 seconds to collect your responses. Presenting today, we have Peter Ostro, Research Director at Serious Decisions, and Michael Schultz, VP of Marketing and Business Development at ClearSlide. Serious Decisions is the leading global B2B research and advisory firm delivering the actionable intelligence, transformative frameworks, and expert guidance that equip executives to elevate sales, marketing, and product performance. I'll let you take it from here, Peter. Thanks, Kathy. So I very much appreciate the chance to join everybody today. Um, what I'd like to start with is just to look at actually from an agenda perspective the key takeaways that we'll all be sharing at the end of our presentation today. And I think by presenting them at the beginning of our discussion, it helps us understand um, some of the rationale for getting together and the major topical points that we'll be covering during the webinar. So first of all, um, when we say that buyers are not in the self-service business as much as you think, um, this is going to be our first mini chapter today, a short one. Uh, about how both the buyer's journey and their destination matter. Um, there's a lot of talk out there about what percentage of the buyer's journey is hidden from us and how buyers do or don't want to talk to sellers. But when we get into the topic of content and how effectively content is used from marketing and from selling professionals in concert with one another, we understand that a great deal of interaction and content is actually required to create positive B2B sales results. Then if we imagine a world where less content is actually a good thing, um, there is actually some benefit to going green around sales content. Uh, too much of it really it doesn't help anybody. Um, and the more we require our sales professionals and channel partners to go looking for the right message, uh, the more likely they are to just download too much, send too much, show up and throw up, and create sort of a content cascade that doesn't really help their buyers understand their solution or their product. Our next uh, subject today will be about hope. It is not a strategy, but neither is mobility. And we'll talk briefly, but effectively, hopefully, about how important it is for everything that we're doing in terms of enabling our sellers with the right type of content and giving them the insights into how that content impacts their buyers and their customers and prospects needs to be fully mobilized. Uh, then we're going to talk for the most part today about our opportunity to empower, activate, and win. Um, this is where we're going to talk about how winners empower and activate content, and we'll be dividing that up into two subsections, empowerment or internal content for training purposes, and then, of course, the external activation content that we see strong performing companies isolating inside sales asset management solutions and platforms to make sure that all of this is done as efficiently as possible. And lastly, we'll touch on analytics. Louis Pasteur famously said that chance favors the prepared mind. And I personally am a firm believer in having as much data as possible before I go into any particular conversation, presentation, voting booth, or anything that has to requires my need to make some sort of a decision. All right, so let's go with our first topic today, a buyer engagement, because the journey and the destination matter. So we did some research recently here at Serious Decisions, and we asked our survey takers in the B2B space um, how important is the content that your sales rep provides to you during the middle, beginning, middle, and end of your entire buyer's journey? And as you can see towards the bottom right, we see the opportunities for not very much, somewhat, or a lot. And as you can tell, there's a lot of emphasis on very or extremely important content. In fact, as you can see, 79% of B2B buyers report that their rep provided content is very or extremely influential in their selection over one kind of solution or vendor. Now, the interesting thing about this is we asked a subsequent question, which allowed us to understand not just the content, but the interactions with their sales rep or their account manager. What you can see here is that content beats out interactions by a 16% delta in terms of the importance to the buyer. But in reality, both of these scored very, very highly, and both are very much required for a successful B2B sale. It's the balance between these two, the content and the interactions, that drives the right kind of impact for successful B2B selling. It emphasizes again to us how important sales still is to the B2B buying process, and it also makes us understand that well-tuned, well-trained, 
and well-empowered sales professionals are the key messengers who provide a conduit for all of that content that eventually finds its way to their buyers. So when we have both the interactions and the content perfectly aligned, that is when we have a win. The interaction competencies and the excellence in content makes us understand that the focus that we put on gathering, collecting, finding, using, and personalizing content empowers reps to be their very best seller. Now we're going to show you one of the uh, famous models and frameworks that we have here at Serious Decisions. This is our attribute-based sales process. And it's how we sort of help organizations define how to interlock the buyer and seller attributes and consumption of content and activities and assets throughout that sales cycle, or as of course most folks refer to it today, the buyer's journey. So any student of Serious Decisions content understands that we have a kind of cadence that we've talked about in terms of the demand waterfall and the buyer's journey. And from the early stages of education through the middle stages of solution identification through the final selection of a vendor or a solution or a product or an application, buyers will go through all of these six stages. The stages can vary dramatically in terms of their length and from industry to industry, scenario to scenario, geographic emphasis, can have different impacts on these, but just about every B2B sale goes through these steps from the standpoint of the buyer's journey. Now, we believe that the selling journey, the attributes of the seller, have to match in a vertical fashion each of these same buyer attributes. So as we educate our sellers so that they can educate our buyers, and then they move into the solution identification and finally selection phase for their buyers, regardless of what we're selling, we could be selling air ventilation systems. We could be selling software for learning management or human resources. We could be selling airplanes or bridges. It doesn't matter what the B2B sale involves. The constant that we see throughout all of our search and our research into our customer base is that the content that helps a sales rep, whether it's training content or buyer-facing content, needs to find that rep where they live, both physically and metaphorically physically on the devices that they use, their phones, their tablets, their PCs, whatever, as well as geographically where they might be doing their job, whether it's out in the field and disconnected if they're selling high-end farm equipment or wired or at the soccer game pretending to watch the goals that are scored but getting some of their work done. And then, of course, metaphorically, the content has to find the rep in the context of where they live in the, each of their sales opportunities, early, mid, and late stage. So as we fill in the middle between the buyer's journey and the seller's attributes, we have this deliberately repeated cadence here that tells us that at each of these stages, you need to understand what are the different activities that our buyer goes through and the assets that they consume that provide us with a knowledge inflection point that says, yes, this is now moved from stage A to stage B, or from 30% likely to close to 50% likely to close. In real time, because as we know, salespeople, like all professionals, suffer from the forgetting curve. Anywhere from 87 to 93 percent of training content is forgotten within 30 days' time. It's important to provide them with the learning assets and the guided selling activities and ultimately to determine what are the observable outcomes that at each stage of their unified journey with their buyer that everyone is in sync and the glue that holds this synchronicity together is all about content. Just as our buyers are most likely and more likely than ever before in this era of Pokemon Go and you know, instant gratification to consume what they need only in real time, so do are the best sellers that we see in the most successful companies also consuming their internal act empowerment content at the exact same cadence. So what this brings us to is another way of looking at our attribute-based sales process, and this is where we think about the assets that then help populate both the seller's education and the buyer's consumption. And when we look at this in the context of the activation content for the buyer and the empowerment content for the seller, this is where we start to understand that content finding the reps is one thing, but in addition to that, the category that we would refer to as assets is actually a larger set than that of just content. Assets can include not just brochures and whatnot, they can include subject matter experts, it can include tribal knowledge, collaborative platforms for sharing and ranking, and user-generated content. How else can a sales rep today answer all of their objections that they get from their buyers instantly? How can they locate crucial corporate data in real time without having to 
go back and check with the headquarters or check with the boss? And how can they provide instant consult given the guided selling wizards that are available from application providers as well as these sales asset management platforms that we'll be talking about? When you deploy them, the ultimate goal should be for your reps to basically never be saying, I will get back to you on that. What does this result in? The perfect alignment of the stars when the buyer's journey is very, very real, but coalesces into that sales cycle for the best sellers. What we see here at Serious Decisions is that content-driven selling leverages the sales asset management processes and protocols and platforms that we've been studying to develop more tailored follow-ups to conversations, to develop social and mobile-friendly thought leadership, and always, always, always understanding how the buyer's cadence demands more or less content, as well as which flavors should of content they're most likely to consume at each stage in their journey. Hey, Peter, uh, this is Michael. Just, just kind of a question that, that, that could be helpful for a lot of folks is that, you know, we, we've seen a lot of movement how the buying process has accelerated. Uh, you know, buyers are much further along in the buying process before they ever uh, reach a, a sales rep. Uh, what have you seen in terms of the acceleration of this buying cycle on uh, kind of this construct that, that you've been talking about? Yeah, sure, Mike. Um, you know, there's a lot of prognosticators in, in industry who will tell you that X percentage of the buyer's journey is now completed before a buyer reveals themselves to the seller. Um, I don't know exactly what kind of science can go into determining that as precisely as some folks claim to have determined it. So maybe there's a little bit of a finger in the wind to that, you know, that, that data set. But I won't argue that that number is higher than it once was, and it's more complex than it ever was. You know, if we just think about ourselves as consumers, whether it's a book on the Kindle or, you know, something on Amazon or, you know, whatever the Pokemon Go uh, model is once it gets beyond the freemium, I proudly know nothing about it, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, my take on that that hidden sales cycle is that it's kind of there, but people are influenced by content at all stages of their journey. And whether that content is being presented in a one-to-many scenario from the marketing team or in a one-to-one -one scenario after that personal connection is made with their seller, it has to be spot on. It has to find the rep where they live inside of their opportunities so that they are guided towards what is most likely to work in that particular conversation. And of course, it needs to be impactful when it actually reaches the buyer. So um, that brings us to our next uh, little chapter here, uh, when going green generates more sales. And the idea behind this is that messaging needs to be more targeted as we as consumers, both business and personal, have higher and higher expectations for what kind of content will find us. I mean, I get frustrated if I log on to an e-commerce site and it doesn't say, welcome back, Peter. And you know, the three seconds that I have to take to log in or find or remember my password admittedly is a very, very first world problem, but you know, our expectations are so high right now for these interactions that all of the content used to you know, lure us into whatever kind of conversation or buying environment we enter has to be spot on. So interestingly enough, we did some research around this, and if there's one data point that is the shocker that you guys need to think about coming out of today's uh, webinar, it is this, 65% of sales content created by marketing never used by sales. Now, I mean, if you're a Major League Baseball player and you fail 65% of the time at the plate, only 65%, you're probably going to the Hall of Fame. Um, if you're Phil Mickelson and you shot a 65 um, at Royal Troon, you should have won the British Open, but you lost, as you have 10 other times gotten second place in majors. I, I feel sorry for the guy to some extent. But in reality, a 65% fail in terms of the marketing sales relationship and alignment is completely, completely unacceptable. So there are many paths to this frustration. And here is what our survey respondents talk to us about. Um, I know the content is there, but I can't find it. Uh, I can find it, but it's off topic. Uh, maybe it's on topic, but I, I can't show this exactly the way it is to my buyer because there's an element or two. What do you mean I can't make a change to that element or two? I need to show this to my client, but it has to have a change made to it. Well, submit a ticket. I mean, we all have been down that road. The barriers that are thrown in the way of sellers using appropriate, great content for their buyers unfortunately apply nearly two-thirds of the time when these assets are being created by the marketing team. The lesson that we have here is that sales content has to be three things, findable, usable, 
and customizable, and that refers to both the exterior activation content that we send in front of our buyers, as well as the internal empowerment content that we use the same sales asset management platforms to support our sellers with internal training and messaging. Yeah. Hey, Peter, this, this is uh, Michael again. It, it, one of the, there's a great piece of research that actually we did with you a, a while back, uh, which was that almost 440 hours a year of a sales rep's time on average is spent searching for content. So I think it, it matches some of the things you're talking about. Can you talk about the impact that this is having uh, you know, on organizations just from a productivity standpoint? It's humongous, Mike. I mean, we, we work with our customers on these time and motion studies. We call it the relative productivity framework. And it's a fancy way of basically saying, how do you spend your time? Um, but in a typical sort of geeky analyst fashion, we have the four quadrants of a square. And on the right-hand side are the uh, customer-facing activities. And on the left-hand side are the internal. Across the top are core. And across the bottom are non-core. And what our customers find out is exactly to your point, that you know any percentage point of time that their reps are spending doing necessary things but inefficiently like expense reports and you know digging up content especially going to look for it that is unproductive time and the minutes and hours and days that are lost to the average b2b seller per year are horrendous now you know to some people i get my job done i make my number i don't care if it's 39 or 49 hours that i work per week <clears throat> but there's the idea of employee engagement and we've seen a lot in the research library here, um, examples of organizations who benefit at the big picture level in terms of revenue growth, you know, rep uh, uh, turnover being lower, et cetera, when they put these better tools in front of their reps because people do get frustrated and will sometimes leave jobs, especially if they're an A player sales professional, if their company makes it hard for them to do their job. So it's a productivity loss at the individual level, but it's also a consistency loss at the executive level. So there's a lot of symptoms, Mike, of this situation. And as you guys who are joining us today can see, um, too much content is sometimes the issue. It's not sometimes aligned with that buyer's journey. Um, nobody owns the content. I can't make change to it. Um, so we hear about all of these complaints consistently from our clients who talk to us about, you know, how do I create a sales asset management protocol or process or use a solution to solve some of these issues and again, the big red flags here about complaints shouldn't go un, un, undiscovered. They shouldn't go um, unaddressed because anybody who's a sales enablement professional knows that it's a very fine line between enabling and preventing sales. And sometimes it's not what you want to do, but it's the perception of the team. And by throwing content at folks that's not aligned with their buyer's journey or that's not aligned with where they physically or metaphorically live in terms of their opportunities, we're doing ourselves a lot of damage and not very much good. So let's dig a little bit deeper, Mike, into the um, sales asset life cycle. And if we look at sort of the circle of life that we have here, um, when we talk about, you know, how is content uh, living and existing throughout its entire life cycle in the enterprise, um, we've got a lot of sub stages here. And when you folks are designing your own sales asset management protocol, it's worthwhile thinking about these particular stages as your own chronology as you, uh, as you roll things out. From a creation standpoint, um, one thing that's important to remember is that any new asset management or content-oriented deployment should not just be lipstick on a pig. Don't just reskin all of your existing library. Use this as an opportunity, as an inflection point to flush out all the old content and definitely include some new content it's very highly likely that a new sales asset management system without a refresh of content will fail because people will, in fact, just see it as a new skin and not something that provides them with new assets that they can use. And remember, the sources of content can vary very widely. It's not just white papers and webinars and battle cards and infographics. It can be access to internal um, uh, subject matter experts, you know, uh, customer referrals, you know, and all the other types of things that organizations use to help drive those conversations along. Then when we talk about storage, you know, we have talked to organizations with literally thousands of SharePoint sites. Nobody knows where or how to find anything. In fact, I think store is better perhaps termed as find. And our mantra here, as you've started to hear today, is that in the ideal sales asset management deployment, reps don't very often have to go look for stuff. Stuff finds them. Now, how does it find them? I'm a sales rep, I'm selling enterprise software, 
I've had a good meeting and I quickly update on my phone or my device of any sort the record in my Salesforce automation platform. That automatically triggers a well-integrated sales asset management solution to understand that not only is my opportunity moved from 35% to 50% likely to close, that provides one variable that triggers what kind of content would next be most appropriate for me to share with my buyer, but also it predictively analyzes and looks at sub-variables such as geography, industry, product, vertical, buyer persona, and then it says, hey, Peter, look, not only is your uh, opportunity having moved from you know, 35 to 40% likely to close, earn the right to have some content that we're going to suggest to you, the system being the royal we here, but wins that occurred in our organization in the past that reflected some of the other elements or attributes of your opportunity were most frequently associated with these particular content asset types. So again, the storage is really more about finding, and that might represent a bit of an ideal, but we have plenty of clients who have gotten to that point. Managing is all about tagging and user-generated ratings. Um, we all talk about raising you know, A, B players up to A players, identifying our A players. But what about identifying our A content? By carefully tagging and keeping a library that's, that's, that's nice and neat and not an event, but a lifestyle of, of tagging and user-generated user ratings associated with the most effective content, we have this collective understanding as to what kind of our stuff works and what stuff is not working. Now delivery, let's make sure that it's friendly in three ways. It's mobile friendly, it's social friendly, and it's millennial friendly. Um, although I'll remove the Pokemon Go attribute from that millennial friendly, your sales content does not have to pop up in the middle of a lake. Um, and then from a sharing perspective, uh, again, we spoke about user generation of comments. Um, in this day and age, you know, the folks who are entering our sales workforce are for the most part now millennials. And these individuals are very comfortable in a user-generated content world. They've grown up with it. Sharing is not nearly as anathema to them as it was to uh, those of us who sold pre-digital age or pre-21st century where we didn't share best practices and kept our leads all to ourselves. Um, it has to be shareable amongst people, amongst channel partners, whoever is using the content. And then finally, measurement is all about the activity tracking. Um, making sure that we understand through the sales asset management uh, solution which of our content elements falls into and outside of that 65%, and then what happens to the content once it gets to the buyer. Do they open it? Do they click on it? Do they skip over it? These are the ways in which we get into some of the sales asset management 101 points on this slide, which is all about trying to reduce that 65% of unused content, which is just such a waste of you know of energy and resources that we, we all want to do away with that. So the core functionalities of a sales asset management system as you start to consider what you're going to roll out are these at the top. First of all, when we talk about sales content preparation, a SAM, uh, a SAM deployment needs to allow a rep to locate, prepare, and catalog all of the assets they're going to need during a specific meeting or in a specific email chain or associated with an individual or opportunity. The system also has to have content management and distribution features. Um, it needs to have a nice, simple interface for both the content creators who are going to manage and distribute the content and also for the reps. We've all been you know, trained by Steve Jobs to, to expect you know, ease of use at an nth level these days. There needs to be a very easy way for reps to identify and bookmark the content that they're going to want to use later and to associate their favorites and non-favorites with their own opportunities and their own successes and, as appropriate, their failures so they can know what doesn't work. Content presentation. Most of the sales asset management solutions available now make it laptop or mobile friendly. This makes sure that we can track which assets the reps are using throughout the cycle, and it needs to be real. It needs to be usable online, offline, um, and asynchronously available. And then finally, the reporting and analytics is the fourth of these four core requirements that we see at Serious Decisions around a sales asset management solution. They need to be able to create and modify dashboards, and the analytics data needs to be very easy to interpret even at the sales rep level. The quality of the assets also, by the way, can be part of this reporting and analytical uh, phrase where we look at buyer consumption, especially, of course, against the one deals, and we're going to look at winning and losing content shortly. Now, if you guys have been able to sort of absorb all of this or you've got a SAM in place and you've got that down, then across the bottom of our slide here, we've got some of the more advanced functionalities. This is for your stronger sales enablement teams. 
Um, don't pursue any of these without making sure that you have the core elements in place, but the social tools, the playbook design, um, connecting, if appropriate, to a CPQ or uh, RFP generation module. These are all some of the more advanced sales asset management 102s, really. Uh, but when we look at solutions and we guide and talk to our customers about how companies can minimize that 65%, maximize the amount of time that their reps are spending selling, these are the functionalities that help the most. Now, when we look at the cost and benefit of sales asset management solutions, you have to think about the must-haves versus nice-to-haves. No one has an unlimited budget. On the cost side of the equation, um, we have to make sure to look at some of the um, you know, claims that asset management providers will make. Um, APIs are nice, but is the solution truly plug-and-play? Make sure that the techies in your vendor's organization and on your team are talking to one another. Uh, will the vendor support or execute on content audit? Will they help you clean it out, or is that part of your responsibility? You know, is it a one-time implementation and integration? Or on an ongoing basis, how are these subscription costs going to vary depending on the personas who populate the different flavors of seats that you might be buying? And from a support perspective, you know, how are you going to leverage this investment? Are you going to hire people or repurpose internal resources to support the SAM? Um, if there's no one in your organization with sales enablement in their title, you may not even want to go down this road. You know, what is the long term you're going to need from the vendor if you don't have those resources in place? All of these represent costs, but those, of course, are weighed against the benefits. First and foremost is the productivity. And as we mentioned earlier around the time and motion studies that um, we conduct here with some companies, uh, the productivity needs to be measured before and after any discrete technology deployment in sales enablement. Uh, whether it's time in motion, whether it's the lagging indicators of quota attainment, we tend to prefer the leading indicators in terms of how are people spending their time, not what did they get done with their time, because at the end of the quarter, when we discover we didn't hit our number, unless you're Marty McFly, it's too late to make changes to that. In terms of the opportunity cost, you know, what is the, what is the cost of not deploying our sales asset management solution? Um, what is the negative value of not doing this, that, or the other thing? And are there some costs even internally of perhaps not supporting our reps so far to the point with technology that they are less engaged and more likely to take those calls from headhunters? And again, just speaking one moment about that marketplace, we've almost never seen in this century a market where the supply and demand were so unevenly skewed as they are in B2B sales. Only 3% of A players, our research tells us, are currently looking for work and the rate at which the millennial sales uh, professionals are leaving the workforce is far larger. I'm sorry, the, the boomers like, you know, who are leaving the workforce is far larger than the less willing millennials who are entering the sales roles. And then finally, when we look at system replacement, you know, we've got both the green and the red ink there on purpose because um, sometimes you can um, upgrade an existing technology or existing integrations. There could be a cost to implementing a new system if you don't think about what is going to be some of the other um, hard and soft costs of making some changes in our data, changes in our protocol. These things do take money and time off of other people's plates. And then finally, when we look at the adoption, um, again, we spoke briefly about leading versus lagging indicators. I don't know of a single chief sales officer who ever got bonused because they increased adoption of a sales enablement or sales effectiveness technology. What we do see is that organizations that make a reasonable and well thought out investment in these platforms create a view so that the leading indicators, the things that people are doing, the size of their pipeline that they're generating, the amount of activities that they're having that are positive interactions with customers will lead to very positive lagging indicators which are not under our control but of course, these are the things that the executives at the top of our organizations only pay attention to. All right, let's go on to our next chapter, and this is about untethered selling. Seriously, folks, are we still discussing mobility? Uh, unfortunately, we are discussing mobility. Um, I don't understand much about the singularity, the blend of man and machine, but there was a singularity of sorts about three years ago, and that's when the number of global users of mobile devices outpaced the number of users of desktop devices. So we probably don't need to say much more about this other than the fact that if all of your sales enablement technologies and platforms, if your sales asset management solution that you have or are considering are not firmly designed to be as mobile friendly as they need to be, then you need to rethink your entire strategy. 
Now, one strategy that we don't recommend is thinking that a bring your own device environment is the same as a bring your own platform environment. There's a big difference between everybody having their phone and bringing it to work or even just buying uh, you know, devices for the team um, and then just expecting that they're going to connect to your website, connect to your SFA, even connect to your sales asset management platform. As with so many technology platforms, sales mobility tells us that you know, what was recently considered leading edge is pretty much just passe right now. The platform has to integrate the activities, the content, and the opportunities as if it was a mobile workstation with every bit of functionality as the laptop that I'm using right now to speak with you guys. Hey, hey Peter, this, this is Michael. I, I loved your comment up front where you talked about you kind of hope is not a strategy. And, you know, I, I see a lot of organizations uh, almost taking the view that, you know, that their, you know, that their iPad is the strategy for, for mobile um, and that, you know, just because they have access to email on the go, that it's somehow going to solve their mobile, mobile issues. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about kind of what you mean by kind of enablement through through mobile? Sure, and actually that's a good precursor, Mike. The the next slide gets into um, another serious decision model, and these things get pretty intense, and and we geek out about this, but uh, um, you know we're, we're 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 proud of our nerd factor here. So so Mike, you're you know you're you're spot on. Buying a lot of iPads for your sales force, you, you know you're buying them silicon. You're not buying them opportunity management. You're not buying them uh, pipeline excellence, and you're certainly not buying them, um, you know, content expertise. Um, the device has to be less important than anything else. What matters is people being able to do their job as effectively as possible. So when we talk about how content needs to find the reps where they live, it's metaphorical in the context of their opportunities, and it's physical in terms of their devices. Um, I mean, let's face it, the, the professional B2B work life is so different today than it was even 10 or 15 years ago. You know, I'm working today from my home office, but this morning I was at the car dealership uh, getting something done, and, and it didn't matter where I was working or what device I was working on, although let's face it, when you talk about mobile first, you don't want that to be mobile only because some people have to use spreadsheets, and that's not working very well on an iPhone. But the idea behind mobile adoption model here is that the work stream needs to be agnostic. And whether, regardless, Mike, of who pays for the device or who reimburses for the, you know, the minutes or the data, that's not relevant. What matters is empowering the team to do their job as well as possible, and the context of the sales team matters more than anything else. Um, in a highly regulated industry, we see you know, less BYOD, bring your own device, but we see more um, you know, reliance on the tablets uh, that are provided by, by the, uh, you know, the, the employers because they do need to have more control over privacy and security of data. Certainly in your medically and pharmaceutically oriented industries and anything having to do with finance, you tend to see something like that. Um, but our adoption model basically says that, that mobility is in itself not a strategy unless you're behind the eight ball, then you kind of have to play some catch up and you go through, you know, the six and 18 and plus month cadence that helps you get to that point. But as a few checkpoints to understand, how do I deal with my salespeople and my sales technology, I divide it into these sort of four major categories. First, think about mobile as sort of a pan-initiative overlay, which starts with customer engagement. The impact on sales is that you have to have better, stronger interactions with your buyers. If you are walking a physician practice director down the hallway, you have 17 seconds to make your pitch. That device better not only show your content, but connect to your inventory and provide the opportunity to sign the contract within those 17 or so seconds. The customer engagement will, will be that strong from your competitors, so you need to make sure that that's in place. On the side of our organization, it allows us to create more of these guided selling scenarios. And you know, even for fairly complex, high-level B2B selling, if-then statements, the word if and the word then, you know, before and after, and decision trees actually have a lot of value in terms of understanding, especially when we have some of the predictive analytics that are populating some of these solutions, if somebody has said or done or consumed something on the buyer side, then a certain type of asset is most likely to be helpful to them. And that will help us engage the customer that much more effectively. Next, content discoverability is crucial. Time and motion. It's little needs to be more said other than making sure we maximize our sales rep's time and finding the content is ultimately important, as well as the tagging on the technology side so that everything we possibly need by keyword, by scenario, 
by region, by SKU, whatever the variables are that are used in your sales asset management or SAM deployment, that those are in place. Just-in-time content is all about not just finding assets, but inventory, um, sales uh, subject matter experts, other hidden gems that we see out there that companies can leverage, battle cards, and not just demos. And then on the technology side, outside of the customer impact, making sure that instant and immediately integrated interface with all devices, that becomes part of the key mobile strategy. And finally, in terms of productivity, it's all about the rep's time. And on the technology side, just about everything that we see here is cloud-based. And I don't think we need to probably talk for a long time about why that's necessary. All right, let's talk now about our most important chapter, and then we'll wrap things up and move to our Q&A. Um, how do winners empower and activate content? And what we look at here at Serious Decisions is we define sales assets in two different ways. There are two distinct types of content. First, we look at empowerment content, which is internal content and assets and support that we use to help train and educate our, our sales professionals, both early when they're still joining us and they're on their onboarding honeymoon, as well as long term with snackable content that's asynchronously con consumed and helps reinforce both old lessons learned as well as new initiatives and new messages. And then we have our activation content, traditional collateral, usually supplied by marketing, but other sources are fine to help our sellers put the right message in front of the right buyer at the right time. Now, let's dig a little bit deeper into empowerment content, and then we'll go back to activation. In our recent survey that we did, we asked three major questions around what helps create winning deals, and then contrasted that with what creates losing deals. And we asked three major questions of our survey respondents in this particular subsection of the survey. What are the internal job aids that you leverage during the sales cycle? In other words, what is provided to your sales reps and channel partners to help them do their jobs better from an internal consumption standpoint? When during the sales cycle was that content deployed? And finally, what was the impact on the desired outcome? Now, another variable in addition to performance here, by the way, is the efficiency of training and certification and onboarding and of learning reinforcement. Again, how to optimize the time spent selling has to do with going right back to the training and onboarding. We've got a whole nother hour we could spend on onboarding and some of the horror shows that are going on out there, but I'll just give you one onboarding statistic to freak you guys out. 28% of companies tell serious decisions that they put their B2B professional sellers in front of buyers on their first day on the job. I might like data for a living, Mike, but sometimes data scares me. All right, now we're going to take a look at the high versus the low performers. And here we're going to have some fun little graphics that help us understand along the pathway that a buyer takes in their journey, what are the average number of assets that they consume by stage as they move from their early to their mid to the late components of their interactions with the selling organization. And then, as you'll see here across the bottom, how do the high-performing organizations versus low-performing organizations actually treat the content and quality and quantity of content that they provide to help educate their sellers. So as we move the car through our little phases here, we see that in the early stages, high-performing sales reps consume a lot more internal empowerment content than low-performing sales reps. And we move along to the middle stage of a buyer's journey, and guess what? That calculus is flipped, and actually high performers consume 15% less content during the middle stages of their buyer's deals. At the late stage, it flips back with even more dramatic fashion. And here's exactly 100%, twice as much content is, is consumed by the high performers versus low performers. So let's get into this a little bit. It's not surprising that reps consume empowerment content across all their stages. And it's actually not even that shocking that high performing reps leverage on average 11 documents over the course of each individual opportunity's journey. What's compelling though is when the reps are leveraging this content. The strong performers who are hitting their numbers, they come out strong out of the gate. They understand what they don't know, and the early stage of their buyer's journey is when that seller, high-performing seller is saying to themselves, how do I know what I don't know? How can I learn as much as possible to help my buyer? What we see is that they reduce that quantity over time throughout the buyer's journey. The low-performing reps, on the other hand, they kind of are a little bit too eager to get in front of the client. They throw some stuff together. They don't go out as educated and as prepared as they should be. Then in the middle stages, when the deals are starting to falter or slow down, because these are, after all, low performers, they scurry around a little bit, 
and their, pa their pattern of quota attainment is right in line with their pattern of content consumption. It's mixed. And then by the end of the buyer's journey, because they're low performers and they're not closing these deals, their total content consumption just comes way, way, way down because they've kind of given up. What's important is to find the right balance between a lot of content and the right content. Targeted content that we help to teach and empower our, con our sellers versus a spray and pay approach. Now, we're going to dig deeper into this and look at the um, contrast around about 20 different asset types. Now, I don't expect anybody who's joining us today to turn their head 45 degrees to the left and look at every single one of these elements. Basically, we asked our survey respondents, what are the top 20 assets that your reps leverage internally for account planning expertise, preparing for customer interactions, and developing the right solutions and proposals and whatnot? What we see here is that the early, middle, and late stages across the board, top performing reps consume 35% more content than low performing reps. Um, this shows the darker color at each of those stages contrasted with the gray. And with very, very few exceptions to the rule, this is actually a supporting statement that says, hey, lots of good on target training content, especially in those early stages for the high performing organizations and the strong performing sales reps are by far the advantageous way to build our sales asset management solution out. Now, when we look in more particular detail, just to highlight what that very, very busy slide tells us, when it comes to internal content, there are some shining stars. The high usage and high impact pieces are the battle cards, the product and service guides, and the well-proven success stories. Again, these are internal. But we also found some hidden gems. High impact but low usage, which are worth making more investment in. Thought leadership, competitive knockouts, and the customer industry primers, which provides the opportunity for sellers to better educate their buyers and their customers and prospects. So now let's wrap up this chapter with our external content. This is what we use to help our buyers move through their journey, traditional sales collateral. And the questions that we asked were, what content or assets did you consume from the winning vendor versus the runner up? How impactful was each of those content assets? And what interactions did you and your colleagues have with sellers from both the winning and running up vendors? Here's where we're going to talk about content that wins versus content that loses. It's kind of like the, the ultimate in a win-loss analysis, but in the context of sales assets and with content management. So throughout the decision-making process, as you can see here, buyers are receiving and consuming content from both marketing and sales. We've got our fun little road visual here. And when we look at the average number of assets that's consumed by the buyer, per sales rep. Look at these numbers as we move from the education through the middle solution to the selection stages, an average of 17.3 assets are consumed from the winning sales rep by our buyers. That is a heck of a lot of content. How do we make sure that that content is accurately presented? How do we know that it's findable, usable, and personalizable? Well, by digging into, again, one of these hugely complex slides, Again, we don't want you guys to think like you're supposed to consume all of this today. This is for our customer base, but we use the buyer's journey as the backbone of the data collection. In each of these stages, what does the winning content look like in terms of the winners and the losers? And we've got 22% more content coming through um, across the board, but we can't forget something, and that content quality is just as important as content quantity. And Mike, you know, I, I want to ask you a question here. I mean, this gets pretty deep into our, our, our geeky nerd stuff here, but I mean, outside of uh, the number one item, which is analyst reports, thank you very much. Um, do you see your customers, you know, getting this, getting into this much detail? Can their data do this type of thing? Yeah, I think that's one. Of, it's a great, it's a great point, uh, Peter. And I think this is one of the reasons why uh, we find customers really uh, found a lot of value with ClearSlide. And you know, when they think about the, the kind of analytics and getting to what's working and what's not, uh, it kind of breaks down to kind of quickly kind of three buckets. So reps are finding an incredible value in understanding what people are clicking on, are they forwarding it, uh, are they engaging with the content that they're sending. Leaders are, are able to really drill in and understand uh, what people are using to be able to move deals forward, is the deal likely to close, where can they coach. And then Marketing is really able to get at the, the information around really at a high level what's working and what's not to be able to better align to what sales is doing. And I think you're right about things like analyst reports and case studies and, and tear sheets. 
is that when you, when you actually understand how things are getting used by all these different groups, it makes you much more productive, which I think is a lot of what the serious decision research is pointing to. Oh, Peter? Whoops, sorry, I leaned on my mute button. Uh, there we go, Mike. Um, so we need to use this, this sort of awareness that you talk about to identify what are the shining stars and what are the hidden gems from an activation content perspective. Um, what are the things that are all highly impactful? They're all listed here, but on the right-hand side are those that are less often leveraged, even though they are impactful. So um, just to wrap up, Mike, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about analytics and my favorite Louis Pasteur quote. Um, I've got a couple of sort of, you know, smarmy challenges for our, our, our guests today. And, and my question is, does your data do this? And it's a little bit of a rhetorical question, but, you know, when we look at some of our own survey work here, this is actually, the results that we find here are, are less relevant than the fact that we can find these results. Um, we, for instance, here found that, that organizations that are selling into RFP versus non-RFP environments look at different types of content differently and use different types of content at different levels. And then with the red circles, we see deltas also in those where the winning organizations are far more likely than the losing organizations to adopt this. I think the point here is that you know, we're all familiar with marketing automation platforms and the analytics that marketers are using to understand the client engagement and buyer engagement with their content. It is time, and in fact, it is now feasible for the same thing to happen with content-driven selling. And frankly, it also speaks to the effectiveness and efficiency of sales reps when we look at the yield per rep to hour, per hour to understand where they should be spending their time, hopefully not looking for, but hopefully seeing and getting delivered to them the kind of content that matters. And here's just another flavor, folks, of, you know, does your data do this? This actually shows in descending order at the education phrase uh, of the buyer's journey which pieces are on activation content side of the house most effective, but then you can see that we have another layer of data that says, well, promotional videos and static brochures are in the top 10 from a, uh, a volume perspective, but they're not in the top 10 from an impact perspective. I share this with you because what's most important to understand is when we look at the top sales enablement initiatives that our, our, our customers and audience members are looking at, Number two on this list is a sales asset management solution or purchase. You know, it's smaller than only one thing, and that is the overall improvement of selling skills of our reps. And what we see is when we look at sales asset management deployments, these are the ideal ways in which organizations are addressing with the technology and, of course, with the process to support the technology, the idea that we can have more than 35% of the marketing produced content have an impact through the sales to create better utilization of the sales rep's time and to address these outcomes that you guys are seeing here now. First of all, your SAM solution must be geared towards an outcome that says the alignment of content with the buyer and seller trajectories. It's no longer enough for an application to focus just on the training content or the presenting content. They both need to be addressed in order to be effective. Assets being usable, findable, we've talked about that over and over again. You know, if we think about the, you know, which social media platform is the next hottest one, it's always about the content and the usability. And the importance of the content that folks see is, is, the, is the function, and then the form is the application that's the hottest thing at the moment. You know, I mean, I've seen my children through the years migrate from, you know, Facebook to Twitter to, uh, you know, Instagram to Snapchat, and, you know, who knows what the next one will be. But it's a good lesson for how to make sure that the findability and ease of use is there when we're looking at our B2B sellers. Content finding the reps at the right time based on the taxonomy and tags we talked about. Never pursue, folks, never pursue a sales asset management initiative without making sure that that tagging and taxonomy does not include multiple stakeholders who are riding along with the reps. Um, folks who are living and breathing out in the field and reps themselves should be involved in that process. Closing the loop to have data-driven feedback we've talked about now. Do the reps like it? Are they using it? and does it have the desired impact? Guys, this is ground zero for marketing and sales alignment. If that 65% number was freaky, let's all work together and figure out what are the processes and technologies that are gonna help us get to that point. Rep productivity has to be an outcome of any initiative. No, you know, obviously we know that. Um, measuring before and after the deployment of your SAM solution is the way to get to that point. And then finally, we need to laser focus on creating content that wins deals. Quality versus quantity. 
this was achievable more with a platform than it is with a point, and I think having less content associated with the new SAM environment than we had before, but refreshed content that we know work that we know works is in fact the way to drive things forward. So let's just go to my final um, key takeaways that we discussed earlier and just remind everybody of what we were hoping to deliver to you today from a content standpoint. Let's remember that buyers are not in the self-service business as much as they think. The destination and journey both matter, regardless of when we can physically in a one-to-one -one basis be in touch with our buyers. We have to make sure that they are constantly, early and often exposed to the right type of content that finds the sellers where they live. Imagining a world where less content is a winning strategy. Again, when we talk about just sending a bunch of email attachments or retweeting a bunch of presentations, is that as effective as actually understanding what is most likely to influence our buyer the way we want them to move through their journey? Mobility is mobility. I don't think we need to dwell on that anymore. It's not a matter of if, but when you guys are doing that. When we talked about empowering, activating, and winning, this is all about how best-in-class and top-performing organizations both empower and activate their sellers and buyers with content. The empowerment and activation best practices and technologies that we've gone through here are those that are adopted by the strongest-performing organizations that we see. And then finally, from an analytics perspective, you can't measure and you can't distribute content and you can't understand whether there's any impact of your sales enablement initiative if we don't measure before and during and after each of these deployments. So with that, I thank you folks very, very much for allowing me to spend some of your day with you today. And Kathy, I'll throw it back to you for our Q&A. Great. Well, we have some really great questions coming in. Um, one was about uh, just clarifying a stat you mentioned. So I'm not sure if we can kind of back up to that slide, but it was about a 68% more and a 35% more. Uh, this uh, person was a little confused by what that meant. Can you clarify that? Uh, sure. I think they might be referring to maybe the 65% of content is, is not uh, uh, actioned by the sales organization, um, and yet the top performers are, are consuming 35% more or, or using 35% more. They also may, if the 68 was accurately typed, Kathy, um, actually be, be referring to, um, I think, at the early stage of a buyer's journey, that the amount of uh, empowerment content, internal training content, consumed by top performers is 68% higher than those who are the bottom performers. So one question, two answers for the price of one. Okay, great. That's, that's great. Um, another person had some questions about battle cards and as far as sort of explaining what you meant by that. Uh, yeah, battle cards. Um, those are becoming pretty hot right now. Um, in fact, I was just working on, on the design of one this morning. You know, battle cards are um, uh, – Simplistically and physically, they are nothing more than that eight and a half by eleven laminated piece uh, that goes on the wall of my cube, one for each of my prime competitors that tells me with a quick little visual um, impact you know the positives and negatives and messages that my company has figured out are the things that I need to have right in front of me when I talk to my buyers and prospects about each of my competitors or how I talk about my competitors to them. Um, obviously, it can be a PDF, it should be phone friendly. Uh, but it's just a quick reference guide that says, okay, I learned this in training, but you know, someone said, well, I'm considering you and two others. How do you stack up? Um, I'll get back to you on that is the fastest way to losing a deal. Great. A uh, few more questions here. Um, one person is asking, uh, we, we've mapped out our buyer's journey. Our marketing team uh, also has a sense of you know, which content is most effective at various points, but we get a lot of pushback from the sales team. How can I solve for that? I, I don't understand. I've never seen a sales organization ever push back, Kathy, at anything marketing ever proposed. Never. Um, me, me either. You know, my, <laughs> my, uh, my answer, and you know, Mike, I'd be, I'd, I want to hear your, your input too, is it, my answer is it, it, let the data tell us. I mean, I know that sounds so like a geek cop-out because that's what I am, an analyst, but it's true. Um, capturing the voice of, of two flavors of customers is what top performing organizations do. Both kinds of customers. They're buyers, obviously but also their sellers. I'm a firm believer that treating salespeople as if they were customers is the best way to create a highly engaged and high-performing sales organization. And they do matter, and they do have feelings. We salespeople do have feelings, right, Mike? There is no doubt that everyone has feelings. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's, I, I think this is a great one to, that kind of goes back to some of the stats that you shared earlier, Peter, which is, you know, you, you can really get into actually what's being used and not being used at different stages of the process and being able to really have a system that identifies 
you know, what, are, what, what actually works and what doesn't and what's being used really does matter. But, but I, I do find that part of the reason why there's a little bit of a, a disconnect in prioritization is that uh, sales teams tend to ask for things without actually looking for, for things. And it's because they're trying to get things done very expediently and we may not always have it tagged the right way or, or done the right way. So I think it's a combination of making the content very findable, uh, but it's also to make sure that there's a constant drumbeat around what's working and what's not. You know, a top 10 list, if you think you mentioned battle cards, you know, I've, I've also seen a, having a top 10 most used content list that's readily available tends to help eliminate a lot of the the needs around prioritization and net new content creation. I would agree. We've seen some great sales enablement deployments where, you know, a bi-weekly digest comes out, um, you know, and it combines some of those, those things that you don't mind uh, mass emails for. Congratulations to the following big wins. Um, you know, here's the content that was most successfully used and just a couple of other quick items that, that sort of blend the whole sort of content driven environment in with some of the, key vital stats that everybody's concerned with around quota. So another audience question here, how do you prioritize creating sales enabled content versus lead generation content? How can you modify each content so you don't have to duplicate work? Um, maybe I'm going to punt that to you, Mike, because that sounds like something that's a little bit going to be more down, you know, in marketing's wheelhouse. At least, you know, why don't you take a pop at that first and then I'll, I'll, I'll feed back. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that really gets to the really the last question that 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 we answered uh, is, uh, you know, understanding what works and, and, and what doesn't doesn't work, and, and there's obviously a lot of nuance here around kind of where where do you invest your time uh, in terms of content creation. I, I do find that the best practices uh, really don't always create two sets of materials. Um, that whatever you use in lead generation really should be able to get used. By, by the sales team in a very effective way. I think that the differences are things like battle cards, um, uh, you know, et cetera. But you'll know, take the analyst report, for example. Like, there's not a different analyst report. So if you're going to invest the time, really focus it in on, on what, what you actually need to go communicate, what your value prop is, what you want to get across. And I think that, again, tends to, tends to work for both, for both audiences with the right sales enablement training on, on how to go use content. I think we have yeah, some time I, for maybe one. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go. Nope, go for it, Kathy. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, uh, and it is I find it hard to believe that buyers consume 17 pieces of content from their sales rep. Where do you draw the so the line, or what's the definition of, of an asset? Uh, yeah, that that's a very big number, and and I I almost would have been surprised if if that didn't elicit some of the you know some of that reaction. Um, content takes a lot of different formats. Let's, let's remember, um, it's not limited to just the number of attachments that the rep sends to the buyer over the course of their journey. Uh, let's all hope that it's not 17, or at least not 17 with one message. <laughs> I think we've all been down that road. Um, it can be content that they consume um, through, um, a third, you know, through a link, through a portal. Um, it can be redirects on web links. You know, it can also be you know, going through a tweet you know, there's a lot of different channels with which we communicate with one another. And, you know, not to go too down, far down the social selling path, but um, it is just, you know, social selling is selling today. And if you're not using the appropriate vehicle with the appropriate audience, and I should probably pluralize that term vehicle to vehicles, you know, then you're not taking advantage of all the different ways in which your buyer is consuming. The trick, of course, is to understand what are the channels as well as what is the content where the buyer is most likely to successfully consume what I have to show them. And what we see the top performers doing is using these platforms and the processes around the communications to understand and to not be throwing darts at a full wall full of opportunities, but to actually understand where the bull's lie is most likely situated and take their best aim because the analytics built into their content library, when properly tagged, when fully integrated with the opportunity levels inside the Salesforce automation platform, allow them to much better predict which of those pieces of content is most likely to have an impact. And again, content is throughout the journey. We see winners you know, diminishing over time, but they're still sending you know, four to five pieces even at the final selection stage of their buyer's journey. Um, bad sellers send the wrong content at the wrong time, 
and that's why the results are so poor. Thank you. So in closing, I'll answer the last question myself, which is, is the recording available after the webinar? And the answer is yes. It'll be available um, within minutes after, after we close now. So thank you so much, Peter and Michael. Uh, please join us again soon, and have a great day. Hello? Content understands that we have a kind of cadence that we've talked about in terms of the demand waterfall and the buyer's journey. And from the early stages of education through the middle stages of solution identification through the final selection of a vendor or a solution or a product or an application, buyers will go through all of these six stages. The stages can vary dramatically in terms of their length and from industry to industry, scenario to scenario, geographic emphasis can have different impacts on these, but just about every B2B sale goes through these steps from the standpoint of the buyer's journey. Now, we believe that the selling journey, the attributes of the seller, have to match in a vertical fashion each of these same buyer attributes. So as we educate our sellers so that they can educate our buyers, and then they move into the solution identification and finally selection phase for their buyers, regardless of what we're selling, we could be selling air ventilation systems. We could be selling software for learning management or human resources. We could be selling airplanes or bridges. It doesn't matter what the B2B sale involves. The constant that we see throughout all of our search and our research into our customer base is that the content that helps a sales rep, whether it's training content or buyer-facing content, needs to find that rep where they live, both physically and metaphorically physically on the devices that they use, their phones, their tablets, their PCs, whatever, as well as geographically where they might be doing their job, whether it's out in the field and disconnected if they're selling high-end farm equipment or wired or at the soccer game pretending to watch the goals that are scored but getting some of their work done. And then, of course, metaphorically, the content has to find the rep in the context of where they live in the, each of their sales opportunities, early, mid, and late stage. So as we fill in the middle between the buyer's journey and the seller's attributes, we have this deliberately repeated cadence here. Welcome to the Clear Slide and Serious Decisions webinar, Sales Engagement Technology, Guiding Reps and Delivering Buyer Insights. We will get started in a couple minutes. So to start, we'll conduct a quick sound check. If you can hear me, please click Ask a Question and type Yes. We'll take 10 seconds to collect your responses. Presenting today, we have Peter Ostro, Research Director at Serious Decisions, and Michael Schultz, VP of Marketing and Business Development at ClearSlide. Serious Decisions is the leading global B2B research and advisory firm delivering the actionable intelligence, 
transformative frameworks, and expert guidance that equip executives to elevate sales, marketing, and product performance. I'll let you take it from here, Peter. Thanks, Kathy. So I very much appreciate the chance to join everybody today. Um, what I'd like to start with is just to look at actually, from an agenda perspective, the key takeaways that we'll all be sharing at the end of our presentation today. And I think by presenting them at the beginning of our discussion, it helps us understand um, some of the rationale for getting together and the major topical points that we'll be covering during the webinar. So first of all, um, when we say that buyers are not in the self-service business as much as you think, um, this is going to be our first mini chapter today, a short one, uh, about how both the buyer's journey and their destination matter. Um, there's a lot of talk out there about what percentage of the buyer's journey is hidden from us and how buyers do or don't want to talk to sellers. But when we get into the topic of content and how effectively content is used from marketing and from selling professionals in concert with one another, we understand that a great deal of interaction and content is actually required to create positive B2B sales results. Then if we imagine a world where less content is actually a good thing, um, there is actually some benefit to going green around sales content. Uh, too much of it really it doesn't help anybody. Um, and the more we require our sales professionals and channel partners to go looking for the right message, uh, the more likely they are to just download too much, send too much, show up and throw up, and create sort of a content cascade that doesn't really help their buyers understand their solution or their product. Our next uh, subject today will be about hope. It is not a strategy, but neither is mobility. And we'll talk briefly, but effectively, hopefully, about how important it is for everything that we're doing in terms of enabling our sellers with the right type of content and giving them the insights into how that content impacts their buyers and their customers and prospects needs to be fully mobilized. Uh, then we're going to talk for the most part today about our opportunity to empower, activate, and win. Um, this is where we're going to talk about how winners empower and activate content, and we'll be dividing that up into two subsections, empowerment or internal content for training purposes, and then, of course, the external activation content that we see strong performing companies isolating inside sales asset management solutions and platforms to make sure that all of this is done as efficiently as possible. And lastly, we'll touch on analytics. Louis Pasteur famously said that chance favors the prepared mind. And I personally am a firm believer in having as much data as possible before I go into any particular conversation, presentation, voting booth, or anything that has to requires my need to make some sort of a decision. All right, so let's go with our first topic today, a buyer engagement, because the journey and the destination matter. So we did some research recently here at Serious Decisions, and we asked our survey takers in the B2B space um, how important is the content that your sales rep provides to you during the middle, beginning, middle, and end of your entire buyer's journey? And is there, that tells us that at each of these stages, you need to understand what are the different activities that our buyer goes through and the assets that they consume that provide us with a knowledge inflection point that says, yes, this is now moved from stage A to stage B or from 30% likely to close to 50% likely to close. In real time, because as we know, salespeople, like all professionals, suffer from the forgetting curve, anywhere from 87 to 93% of training content is forgotten within 30 days' time, it's important to provide them with the learning assets and the guided selling activities and ultimately to determine what are the observable outcomes that at each stage of their unified journey with their buyer that everyone is in sync and the glue that holds this synchronicity together is all about content. Just as our buyers are most likely and more likely than ever before in this era of Pokemon Go and you know, instant gratification to consume what they need only in real time, so do are the best sellers that we see in the most successful companies also consuming their internal act empowerment content at the exact same cadence. So what this brings us to is another way of looking at our attribute-based sales process, and this is where we think about the assets that then help populate both the seller's education and the buyer's consumption. And when we look at this in the context of the activation content for the buyer and the empowerment content for the seller, this is where we start to understand that content finding the reps is one thing, but in addition to that, the category that we would refer to as assets is actually a larger set than that of just content. Assets can include not just brochures and whatnot, 
It can include subject matter experts. It can include tribal knowledge, collaborative platforms for sharing and ranking, and user-generated content. How else can a sales rep today answer all of their objections? You can see towards the bottom right, we see the opportunities for not very much, somewhat, or a lot. And as you can tell, there's a lot of emphasis on very or extremely important content. In fact, as you can see, 79% of B2B buyers report that their rep provided content is very or extremely influential in their selection over one kind of solution or vendor. Now, the interesting thing about this is we asked a subsequent question, which allowed us to understand not just the content, but the interactions with their sales rep or their account manager. What you can see here is that content beats out interactions by a 16% delta in terms of the importance to the buyer. But in reality, both of these scored very, very highly, and both are very much required for a successful B2B sale. It's the balance between these two, the content and the interactions, that drives the right kind of impact for successful B2B selling. It emphasizes again to us how important sales still is to the B2B buying process, and it also makes us understand that well-tuned, well-trained, and well-empowered sales professionals are the key messengers who provide a conduit for all of that content that eventually finds its way to their buyers. So when we have both the interactions and the content perfectly aligned, that is when we have a win. The interaction competencies and the excellence in content makes us understand that the focus that we put on gathering, collecting, finding, using, and personalizing content empowers reps to be their very best seller. Now we're going to show you one of the uh, famous models and frameworks that we have here at Serious Decisions. This is our attribute-based sales process, and it's how we sort of help organizations define how to interlock the buyer and seller attributes and consumption of content and activities and assets throughout that sales cycle, or as of course most folks refer to it today, the buyer's journey. So any student of serious decisions con